right now with Dominic and we're gonna measure the back block and head area of the engine so that we can get the pickup points for the bell housing adapter plate that is gonna be made by Hollinger. What's this tool called that we're using at Steps? Um, it's basically a CMM, which is a coordinate measuring machine. The one he has is made by Romer. So basically, all the uh, bolt locations on the motor are on different heights, and there's some alignment pins and stuff that we need to draw up. And it would take a long time to measure everything out by hand and to do it accurately. So this arm actually will be able to plot all these points, and we can create a drawing from there to build the motor plate for the Hollinger transmission. There you have it. I'll show you guys that in a second when we get the steps, and we'll show you this machine in use. All right, we are down here at Papadakis Racing. What up, Steph? Steph is going to let us use the CMM arm. Yeah, CMM right? uh, Romer arm. That's what this is right here. Yep. So this is going to allow us to map out the back of the engine so that we can send these measurements off to Hollinger in order for them to design uh, the motor plate or the rear adapter for the bell housing that they're going to make. That was kind of scary. It was the first time seeing the bottom of the engine. The, the main bolts are through the bottom. Look at that. You got to go all the way through. Those are the mains. Yeah. All right. So this is a software that we're going to place all of the components all the features. So we want to find the crankshaft and then where the bell housing is going to bolt up and we'll put that into the software using this measurement arm. And then you can use that data to then design stuff around that bolt pattern. Perfect. So you care about the flywheel. Yeah. Um, I'd like to you get- You know what this bolt pattern is because you can get that from Judd. I, I would like to just get these alignment dowels too. Okay, so one, two, three, four. And then these four. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Well, I mean, we might as well get the top as well. Oh, you want to? Just in case while we're here, you know? Yeah. Might as well map out the whole thing. All right. Okay, so the way this works is we are going to make a plane first. So we're going to do probe some points on a plane. So we're going to say, okay, this is our two dimensional flat surface. So we're going to do a few different points. So we're going to say, here. So what we've done is we've created cool that circle on that plane. So that is the crankshaft and you can use the center of that circle to be the center point for the rest of your measurements. Okay. So now we're going to go do the dowels okay. and some of the other bolts. Yep. And the reason we do another plane is because the crankshaft plane where it bolts up is a little bit different to where the bell housing and stuff is going to bolt up. So we're going to do a new plane at that new level, and then we'll do the dowel circles on that. So, so essentially what we're doing is we're doing two dimensional drawings. And once you combine them in the software, you have a three dimensional top uh, map of where things live. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Those are the four dowels. Yep. Two bolts and then two more bolt holes. Yep. Oh, the, yeah, these are the two top ones. Yep. I see what you're saying. Yep. All right, so we are basically all good. Steph has all the plot lines for us mapped out. Uh, we even got a little bit extra than we were expecting, which is awesome. And Steph is just going to put it on a drive for us to bring back. And then Dominic can, what, load that into CAD and start drawing some lines well, and stuff? Yeah, I'll, I'll just create like a basic drawing to send Hollinger and then they could um, figure out which bell housing they're going to use. And then once we know that, we can design the motor plate. That's it. All right, thanks, Steph. Appreciate you letting us use some of your uh, expensive equipment. This will not be the last time because I see a CNC over there. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that we can also come back after this is designed and uh, CNC gets maybe utilized. We'll, we'll, we'll ask you later. We'll yeah, ask you yeah. later. <laughs> Just see, putting a little seed in. Today's gonna be a solid day, guys. Time for some progress. Gonna mount the steering column in the Supra. That is very exciting, because I need to kind of mount the steering wheel in there and pretend like it's <laughs> it's finished. And then uh, we're gonna mount the rear end. So this is something cool that Dominic uh, knew about. So this is actually a Ford Explorer rear end. 
It's all aluminum. Uh, it's really light. And I also sent a ring and pinion out to get lightened. So the ring and pinion is actually six pounds lighter too. So this thing all said and done should probably be like, uh, I'd say like 75 pounds, which is pretty good with half shafts and everything else. Uh, but right now it should be pretty easy to mount into the rear subframe. So stoked, man. We got this stinky old Ford Explorer rear end apart. So we're gonna pull the diff out of it, pull the pinion out of it. Uh, then we're gonna start hacking up the Supra subframe, making some room for this baby. And I also got this nice billet cover for the Ford 8.8. .8. That's gonna be pretty cool. This is our 8.8 .8 rear end that we're using and it had a lot of deterioration from the bushings with the steel on aluminum. So Dominic is gonna clean this shit up on the mill, probably take it down a little bit and just get rid of all this kind of uh, compromised material. And then we have some uh, solid bushings that we're gonna trim down and make to fit. These are actually, I think, from uh, one of my eight sixes and I just had them lying around and they're uh, perfectly usable. So we're just gonna trim them down and make them fit as a solid bushings for the rear end. What's up guys? All right, today we are at Steph Papadakis' shop. Uh, big thanks to Steph for letting us come down here to work so that me and Dom can continue progress on the rear subframe and the 8.8 .8 rear that we're gonna be installing. And we're gonna start cutting up this, or Dom's gonna start cutting up the subframe right now. for it all right we're out of time at steps we're gonna head back north the race service dom has to build a jig for this thing to hold itself into so that when we cut the center uh nothing shifts when some welding starts happening and the pulling with the hot and cold of the welding we just don't want anything to warp or come out of line so um we're gonna head back up there since the jig's gonna take a little bit of time to get sorted out and get this thing bolted down A serious jig guys serious so this is gonna weld to here yeah and then that's gonna hold the differential in its exact spot that we need it to be in Dom can then make all the mounts off of the subframe and obviously in the back as well. Cut points. All right, Dom's got everything prepped. He's got the plates all cut and trimmed and fitted. This goes here, boom. This goes down here, fill in that gap. And so I'm cutting out all these washers to fit in the eccentric bolt holes that we can just weld them in there so there's no more slot. So it's not ovalized like that, it's just a regular bolt hole. Dom is currently finished welding the big plates for the ends of the subframe. And then there's gonna be a bar that goes across and uh, that will be the mount for the back of the case on the rear end.
Dom's tacking in the final piece to hold the rear end in place in the jig. And then he can start doing some, uh, some of the mounting fabrication, as in back here. So right now Dom's gonna drill the locator holes and then we need to drill inch and a half. These are gonna be the lugs that go in here. And then you bolt through here to the diff itself. So since this is two by two, 120 wall, it's really heavy um, having both of them welded together like this. So Dom is going to lighten this thing up. He's gonna just hog out some material that is unneeded in there. Update, it's looking even better now. Template time. Front of the diff going on, baby. This thing is almost done. Front mounts are in, but we are out of material uh, chromoly, so we're gonna have to wait to order some more so Dom can put the fronts and the back covers on these things to really box them in. So we're just going to put this thing in a car, see how it fits, and then put the differential in and see how it bolts up. Make sure everything uh, bolts up nice and fine, everything lines up. I'm sure it does or it is, so uh, we're gonna do that right now. All right, Dom and I are gonna throw the subframe in. Uh, everything should hopefully line up perfectly because he built that sweet jig. And then we'll throw the diff in there and um, we'll be motivated because it's gonna look like something went together. Seriously, subframe never fits so good. <laughs> Guys, it is in. It went in easier than me or Dom ever expected. Literally the easiest subframe we either of us has probably ever put in to a car in our entire life. Now, I know it wasn't loaded and it was light, but literally the bolts, you know, you're always trying to angle and position, but this thing literally just went up and bolted straight in. So it was awesome. And the differential was actually easier to put in on the car than it was on the welding table. So it's, uh, it came out really good. What do you think, Dom? All that extra work is worth it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's pretty nice. Literally everything just looks awesome and seems like it's in a really good spot. Guys, we're moving right along today, getting onto the steering column and the rear end, uh, which is gonna get matter in the rear subframe. Uh, we're gonna run the stock steering column from the Supra. Uh, it's really nice actually because it has telescoping up and down. It's all aluminum. It's really light as well. So you pretty much can't beat the versatility of a steering column like this. That's why we wanna run it in the car. Plenty of room to go up and down for adjusting. I mean, once once I get comfortable and set, it's gonna remain in one spot, but still, it's just cool to, uh, to be able to have a little bit of adjustment on it, especially when mounting it without the seat and all that. And the column pretty much lines up exactly where Dom put the dash bar. All right, I'm gonna get the seat in here and we'll kind of get a little bit of a placement going. I'll get the pedal box out. One of the biggest things I've been pumped on is the pedal box assembly from Tilton. We're just gonna kinda see where this lines up on the floor when I put the seat in. It's gonna be sick, man. Which actually makes it pretty sick. We'll probably come back here, so we're gonna just- It won't be that bad by the time you- It's pretty the long hub, spacer. The hub will be like out to here, and then if you need a spacer and a quick release, yeah. it won't be that bad. Steering will probably be about here where my hand is, roughly. Nice little bend in the elbow. 
I'm gonna do our best to not have to cut into the floor too much, but we might have to a little bit, um, depending on the floor plate and everything, but we'll get to that eventually. This nice. is the new steering rack adjuster. Yeah. I mean, steering column adjuster. Mm-hmm. Damn. Dom just couldn't help himself. Had to modify the steering column. There we go. Dang, dude. Went from that to that. Let's put this thing in the car. Yeah. All right, that looks good. Feels pretty good. All right, we are setting the steering column position. So this is not the actual Recaro seat that we're gonna use, but it's pretty much the same dimensions. Um, so I'm just trying to get centered. We got the tilt and pedal box just kind of placed in here just to kind of get a rough idea of where things are gonna go. Yes. <laughs> you can drive home now. <laughs> Sir. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Dom's currently uh, facing the block of metal that's going to replace these because these were just temporary so that we could get it fit and placed and tack the bracket on there. Uh, everything's feeling good. So um, show you guys a little bit of the machining that Dom's doing for that bracket, or sorry, that spacer right now. Bracket looking dope. Dom's gonna round the edges with the router. Give it a nice clean pro looking look. All right, steering column is officially in. Dom made these sweet additions to it with a lightweight spacer, a sick bracket that welds to the dash bar, uh, this custom adjuster on the side uh, made out of aluminum, and then uh, this last bracket to the firewall here, which ties everything together and makes this thing super stiff and functional. All right, time to move on to the next baby. So these are, are going to be our 3D printed head flanges right here. Um, they're gonna print 12, we printing 12? Printing 12. No, we're printing 11, but there's 12 on here just to fill the void. So it's gonna be actually made out of 3.7 pounds of Inconel. There's a ton of processes to go along with this. I think the print time was uh, 13, 13 and a half hours roughly uh, to make all, all of these. And then we're also gonna be printing our collectors, which I'll show you in a second. It takes about an hour to load the machine with the ink and all metal and get it all prepped and ready. Also, it takes some time to design these parts as well. So um, the unload process or the removal from the machine takes about two hours, three hours. Yeah. And then there's, yeah, there's a little bit of a machining process to clean everything up and get the structure of the support that the lasers make in order to build the part off of. Well, this part, yeah. Yeah. This part. This um, will have minimal support. Yeah, they were actually able, the best way to design the part is with the least amount of support or zero support. So they actually are incredibly talented designers. So the parts are done with zero support. So there's really the processing time after the parts printed is much less than it would be a part that requires all sorts of support structures. It's pretty badass. So these, these babies, these are the collectors, the five into one for each side. 
So there's a slip fit, so the tolerance is super tight. So you see little to no exhaust gas leakage from the joint. All right, let's print some stuff. Let's go. Just watch me carefully. I barely even know what I'm talking about, let alone loading a machine. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna load the machine. This is called the build platen, and this is what the parts are all lasered off of, right? Laser built off of. So this print process of actual print time is about 13 and a half hours to do all 11 of our head flanges. I'm not sure what the collectors are gonna be. Do you know what the collectors are gonna be for print time? Around the same, maybe? Yeah, around the same. Okay, yeah, probably about the same for the two two collectors. So uh, we're getting close. Turn this thing on. So these are the canisters that hold the actual metal. Uh, this is the Inconel 625, and this is what we're using to print our head flanges. And this thing is heavy as all. What are these weight? These things are freaking heavy. 65 and 75. 65 and 75 pounds, and those both get loaded onto the top of the machine up here. Um, as well as, isn't there already metal loaded into the machine before these hoppers are put on yeah, as well. About yeah. 800 pounds. Woo! This one. Yes. There we go. Oh, well, like I gotta enter some data. Yo, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I don't enter data. That's not my job. Click, now start build. Damn. There we go, I did something. There we go. Now uh, it's gonna be 13 hours and 59 minutes later, or something like that. We'll have some parts. So this is about 10, 15 minutes later, and you can start to see the parts being formed on the actual plate. So that's called the recoder, and every time you see that thing wipe past the plate, just like a printer would, it's adding another layer of material for the lasers to weld onto the uh, previous layer. So this is actually how these parts were printed on a tray. They haven't been cut off yet. Uh, There's some head flanges on here and then some tubes for the headers. So it's really cool because you don't see much of the structure on here. It's pretty, the way that they designed it, there's like such a little amount. So what, that makes the post process a little bit faster or a lot of it faster. So this is the structure underneath here in order to support the part as it's adding more weight and more material to it. All right, so this is all the Inconel scrap. So they're gonna let us take a couple pieces so Dominic can just kind of test it out, give it a, get a feel for it before he starts actually getting into the header building and, and welding of our He's Inconel headers. I need like, yeah, like tube stuff would be perfect. This looks... This looks fancy. What's going on here? You guys making decorative art? It's uh, it's, it's art. It's art. It's art. It's art now. <laughs> We're on layer 29 of how many? 681. 681. So still a ways to go, but progress is progress. So this is our finished product of the 3D printed metal in Inconel 625. Jonathan and Chris over at Printed Metal did a phenomenal job. We, ba we gave them basic information on what these needed to be, which is two inch primaries and a three inch exit on the collector. And they did a great job. They added a little extra supports off the header flanges. And then these are slip fits into the primary uh, coming down to the collector on a three inch exit. And it's amazing what you can do with a 3D print because this is so clean in here in the merge section. You couldn't get it this clean by hand. Or if you could, then you are phenomenal. But it's, uh, it's actually unbelievable. It looks like a piece of art to me how well this came out. So we're stoked. The uh, Inconel 625 headers are going to be coming together soon. And this is a great start. Yeah.